Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty 11. After the basketball season ended, the members of Swapo and Ambrosia and my publicist from Gatekeeper Press asked me to speak at a rally protesting Boston University's conferment of an honorary degree and a check for $100 million to Emimofo Godabilisi, the African statesman with all the political foresight of Neville Chamberlain. I was to be the drawing card, the liberal, libertine, and literary nigger stamp of approval. I agreed to speak as long as no one put my grainy mug shot on the flyers. Things looked different from the dais, behind a microphone, squinting into the spring sun. I was struck by how unaccustomed I was to looking down at people. Growing up in southwest Los Angeles, coming off a season of playing in places known as the pit and the hell hole, I was always at the bottom, the spectacle, the fighting cock looking up. Looking up not out of any sense of great admiration, but because from the bottom there is nowhere else to look. On this earthly stratum were all dirt, I just happened to be Precambrian dust buried under layers of Cretaceous, Tertiary, and Quaternary snobs. Some things are always on the top shelf, like paper towels in the supermarket. I stood at the mountaintop, enjoying the view and waiting for my turn to speak. Martin Luther King Jr. Plaza burst with color and protest, an outdoor arboretum where the faces below bloomed like flowers in a meadow. Red and orange revolutionary spring annuals smoked joints, waved signs, and chanted. The yellow and cream-brown daffodils clung stubbornly to their alpaca sweaters and said, excuse me, when the boisterous Puerto Rican and black towny snapdragons stepped on their hush puppies. Communist worker bees with propaganda-pollinated minds made penetrable by 80-degree weather, boom mics swayed in the breeze like marshland cattails. If Boston University persists in leonizing and supporting killers and Uncle Toms like Emimofo Godabilisi, we will not stand idly by and do nothing. This administration's megadollar investment in oligarchical government is. John Brown was trying to fire up the demonstrators. Spittle sprayed from his mouth, his tussled hair hung over one eye, his fist pounded the rostrum. He reminded me so much of Hitler at a Nuremberg party rally that I had to look behind me to check the stage for bunting with swastikas and steamrolled black eagles. Uncle Tom's like Gata Belize must be. There was that phrase again, Uncle Tom, the white liberal euphemism for nigger. No matter how apropos the label, I always wondered how come there are never any white Uncle Toms. How come the Secretary of State is never an Uncle Tom? The director of the CIA is never a traitor to the white race or any other race. Only niggers can be subversives to the cause, everyone else is the real enemy. As if white folk understand the pressures on the African Bantu, the American nigger, to sell his soul in hopes of being untied from the whipping post. John Brown said something about unity and looked over at me for confirmation, I spat on the ground, mouthed an obvious, fuck you, and gazed at the clouds. A silent act of dissension from the keynote speaker not unnoticed by the crowd. John Brown began to falter. He fumbled over his words, and his solidarity rhetoric began to fail him. The crowd grew edgy and started pushing toward the platform. A middle-aged white man clutching a pen and a copy of my just-published book attempted to scale the platform, grabbing at my ankles, Mr. Kaufman. Please sign my book, I understand now. I understand. Scobie moved me back, pressed the sole of his shoe against the man's sweaty skull, and booted him off the stage like Walter Slezak kicking the one-legged amputee into the sea in Hitchcock's lifeboat. A white woman protested, exclaiming, Hey, what about nonviolence? To which Nicholas replied, Who said anything about nonviolence? John Brown bailed out gracefully with an, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Dexter Waverly, president of Ambrosia, the Black Student Union. Dexter strode to the podium, pandering to the crowd with stale slogans. Power to the people, he said. The crowd snapped back, power to the people, 
and back and forth they went in a huge game of Simon Says. Free South Africa. Free South Africa. Emma Mofo Godabilisi sucks. Emma Mofo Godabilisi sucks. With the crowd roused to a frenzy, Dexter held up my book. I'd like you to take your copy of Gunnar Kaufman's phenomenal volume of verse, Watermelonin, and turn to page 133. Now read aloud with me from, Dead Niggers Don't Hokum. Every demonstrator from Boston local to university homesteader seemed to have a copy of the book. They read silently to themselves as Dexter read aloud. I am the lifelessness of the party, the spade who won't put on the lampshade. I couldn't hear the recitation very well because Nicholas was hugging me so tight my vertebrae popped like a string of firecrackers. When he released me, his wet cheek stuck to my face. I'm proud of you, nigger. I heard my name crackle from the loudspeakers and made my way to the podium. Now it is with great pride I introduce star athlete, accomplished poet, black man extraordinaire, voice of a nation, Gunnar Kaufman. Remember, America, Boston University, the world is watching. A camera mounted on a crane swung down and bobbed in my face like a giant metal hummingbird. I looked directly into the lens. Don't do that, the camera person whispered. I continued to look directly into the lens. When I was seven years old, my favorite television personality was Transient Tammy. Sporting patchwork overalls and a floppy hat, Transient Tammy welcomed me home after school with a hearty, howdy, vagrance. Before introducing the last cartoon, she'd put on a pair of enormous sunglasses. These magic glasses gave Transient Tammy the power to see her bummy friends in television land. She'd steal toward the camera, dirty knees bursting through her jeans. I see Suzette in Arcadia, Ingrid in Alhambra, Anthony in Inglewood. I peered into the camera, looking for my mom and Psycho Loco in Hillside, my father, but I didn't see anyone, just my Waleed reflection in the lens. The applause died down, leaving a hum in the air, and I nervously cleared my throat. I wanted to address the crowd like a seasoned revolutionary, open with a smooth activist adage, there's an old Chinese saying, but I didn't know any Chinese sayings, old or new. My hesitancy grew embarrassing. Yoshiko waddled over and ran my hand over the circumference of her bloated belly. I rubbed and smiled but still said nothing. I thought, if I were down there down among the mob, what would I want to hear? Scoby broke the silence, shouting, thus do I ever make my fool my purse. I laughed. The gathering laughed because I laughed. I decided I'd want to hear candor. In the middle of the throng stood a commemorative sculpture. A slightly abstract cast-iron flock of birds in memory of Martin Luther King, Jr., who received his doctorate in theology from Boston University. Do you see that sculpture? I asked, pointing to this commissioned piece of artwork, which did not dedicate a small piece of the earth and time to Reverend King so much as it took partial credit for his success. Notice them steel birds are migrating south, that's BU's way of telling you they don't want you here. The black people began to elbow their way to the front. I was speaking to the Negroes, but the white folks were listening in, their ears pressed to my breast, listening to my heart. Who knows what it says on the plaque at the base of the sculpture? No one spoke. You motherfuckers pass by that ugly ass sculpture every day. You hang your coats on it, open beer bottles on it, meet your hot Friday night dates there, now here you are talking about freedom this and whitey putting shit in the game that and you don't even know what the plaque says? Shit could say, Sieg Heil. Kill all niggers. Auslander Raus, for all you know, stupid motherfuckers. African Americans, my ass. Middle minorities caught between racial polarities, please. Caring, class conscious progressive crackers, shit. Selfish apathetic humans like everybody else. The crowd gave a resounding roar of approval. Here I was denigrating them and the people urged me forward. Candor, I reminded myself, candor. Now I'm not going to front, 
act like the first thing I did when I got to Boston University was proceed directly to the Martin Luther King Memorial and see what the goddamn plaque says. Only reason I know what it says is that I was coming out of Taco Bell on my way to basketball practice when I dropped my burrito deluxe at the base of the monument. When I bent down to wipe the three zesty cheeses, refried beans, and secret hot sauce off my sneakers, I saw what the plaque said. It says, if a man hasn't discovered something he will die for, he isn't fit to live. Martin Luther King, Jr., how many of you motherfuckers are ready to die for black rule in South Africa, and I mean black rule, not black superintendents? Yells and whistles shot through the air. You lying motherfuckers. I talked to Harriet Velikazi, the ANC lieutenant you heard speak earlier, and she's willing to die for South Africa. She don't give a fuck about King's sexist language, she ready to kill her daddy and if need be kill her mama for South Africa. Now don't get me wrong, I want them niggers to get theirs, but I am not willing to die for South Africa, and you ain't either. The audience hushed, their good Samaritan opportunism checkmated. There was nothing they could say. I'm willing to die for South Africa, where do I sign? I rubbed my tired eyes, licked my lips, and leaned into the microphone. So I asked myself, what am I willing to die for? The day when white people treat me with respect and see my life as equally valuable to theirs? No, I ain't willing to die for that, because if they don't know that by now, then they ain't never going to know it. Matter of fact, I ain't ready to die for anything, so I guess I'm just not fit to live. In other words, I'm just ready to die. I'm just ready to die. I realized I'd made a public suicide pact with myself and stole a glance toward Scoby and Yoshiko. Scoby was nodding his head in agreement, while Yoshiko was pointing to her stomach and yelling, What the fuck are you talking about? I swallowed and continued. That's why today's black leadership isn't worth shit, these telegenic niggers are not willing to die. Back in the old days, if someone spoke up against the white man, he or she was willing to die. Today's housebroken niggers travel the country talking themselves hoarse about barbarous white devils, knowing that those devils aren't going to send them to a black hell. And if Uncle Sam even lights a fire under their asses, they backtrack in front of the media, what I meant to say was. The quote was taken out of context. What we need is some new leaders. Leaders who won't apostatize like cowards. Some niggers who are ready to die. The crowd's response startled me. You. You. You, they chanted, pointing their fingers in the air, proclaiming me king of the blacks. Seizing the moment, Dexter Waverly snatched the microphone, put a warm arm around my shoulder. Our new black leader, Gunnar Kaufman. All I could think was what, no s -fepter. Don't I at least get a s -fepter? The next morning the annoyingly perky hosts of Good Morning, a Mary F.A. and its sister shows around the globe, Buenos Dias, Venezuela, Guten Morgen, Dutzfland, among others, took over my living room, asking questions from leather swivel chairs. Buon giorno, Italia. Signore Kaufman, did you know that during last night's reception for MMOFO Gattabalisi, Dexter Waverly killed himself in the college president's office? No. See, S.I., he held a knife to his throat and demanded that President Philby rip up the hundred million dollar check and spit in Gottabalese's champagne or he'd slash his throat. And what happened? Philby ripped up the check and spit in the Zulu's champagne. Signore Waverly apologized for the interruption, read a death poem dedicated to you, then plunged the knife into his throat. Wow. Don't you feel responsible, Signore Kaufman? After all, it was your speech that inspired Signore Waverly. I don't know. What did the poem say? Death poem for Gunnar Kaufman. Abandoning all concern. My larynx bobs, enlightenment is a bitch. That's not a bad poem. But I don't feel responsible for anything anyone else does. I have enough trouble being responsible for myself. Besides, 
it looks like Dexter's death prevented $100 million from being deposited in the National Party's coffers. Bonjour, Fran Fay. Monsieur Kaufman, but what about your endorsement of freedom through suicide? My suicide, no one else's. Yes, but people are following your example. There are reports of black people killing themselves indiscriminately across the United States. Don't you have anything to say? Yes, send me your death poems. Hayua Humenta, Finland. Mr. Kaufman, isn't suicide a way of saying that you've, that black people have given up? Surrendered unconditionally to the racial status quo? That's the Western idea of suicide, the sense of the defeated self. Oh, the dysfunctional people couldn't adjust to our great system, so they killed themselves. Now when a patriotic American, a soldier, for example, jumps on a grenade to save his buddies, that's the ultimate sacrifice. They drape a flag on your coffin, play taps, and your mama gets a Congressional Medal of Honor to put on the mantelpiece. So you see yourself as a hero? No. It is as Mishima once said, sometimes Harakiri makes you win. I just want to win one time. Last laugh? I don't see anyone laughing. This is Namaste, India. And when do you plan to commit suicide, Mr. Kaufman? When I'm good and goddamn ready, 12. During the reading period before finals, Scobie's behavior became increasingly bizarre. The school psychologist's diagnosis was acute homesickness, and she recommended that Nick move in with Yoshiko and me. At first I too thought he missed the old neighborhood. Scobie tried to recreate Los Angeles in Boston. He plastered most of the walls at school with poems torn from my book. He planted palm trees along Commonwealth Avenue, got run out of Roxbury when he tried to pay some Puerto Ricans to act Mexican for a day. He brought home exhaust from the public buses, which he'd bottled in five-gallon water containers, and released the noxious gases in the apartment. We took day trips to gloomy Revere Beach, sitting under the concrete veranda, complaining about the sun setting behind us. Gooner, I hate this place. Everything is ass-backward out here, man. Here we are in May, fully clothed at a beach with no waves. The best pro basketball player in the city's history is white. The women like meek niggers. People eat thick soup, drink green beer. The cops are fat. The fire trucks are green. If I see one more fucking shamrock. It's getting so bad I thought I saw a leprechaun near the river the other day. The obvious solution was for Nicholas to go home, but there was no home for him to go to, the man in the mauve suit had returned and convinced his mother to sell the house and travel the country, skating in an old-timer roller derby league. My mom offered to put him up, but he was too proud. He often called himself the 48th Ronin. Nicholas Scobie was a masterless samurai who missed out on the revenge at Kira's castle in the winter of 1702 and the mass seppuku two weeks later. Gunnar, what would the 48th Ronin do if he was stuck out here in Boston, Massachusetts, home of the frappe and the grinder, masterless and alone? He would kneel at the end of the freedom trail and stick a sword in his belly. Exactly. Gunnar? Yeah. You serious about this whole death trip, winning by straight taking yourself out? I guess so. I meant everything I said, but that don't mean shit, you know. Don't mean I'm right, wrong. The poems, the magazine interviews are just words, man. I'm just saying, look, I'm outta here, all you motherfuckers who act like you give a shit, stop me, you care so much. To kill yourself you don't need a permit or anything like that, do you? Nah, I don't think so. Nick stared past the coastline, and my eyes followed his. The only thing barely visible in the foggy night was Boston's pathetic skyline. The top of the glassy Hancock building poked through a cloud bank that covered its lower floors in a vapory trench coat. Tallest building in Boston, right? Fifty-some-odd stories, the Sunday brunch from the top supposed to be the move. 
You can see to Newfoundland or some shit. They don't have no nighttime dinner thing. Nope. Closed up. What's the second tallest building? The Prudential Building, but I think BU's Law School is the third. Can you get in there at night? Yeah, during finals week the law library is open all night. We finished our beers, arguing over the finiteness of music. I rationalize that there are only so many notes and therefore only so many combinations of notes, so it stood to reason that there are only so many songs. Scobie stood up, preparing to leave, wrapping his belongings in a towel. Look, cuz, you not accounting for time. Time is what makes music infinite. Bip, bip, bap, tid, dit, tap is different from bip bip bop, tid dot tap. See, if Charlie Parker had played Dixie, it would be like colorizing birth of a nation. It'd be a different tune but the same tune. You dig? You'd be hearing it differently and its meaning would change. Because a musician has their own sense of time and experience of time. For Parker, time was a bitch. He wouldn't play Dixie as no happy-go-lucky darky anthem. He'd play it as a, I'm mad and I know them cotton-picking niggers was mad, piss on their graves dirge. You follow? That's why your poems can never be no more than descriptions of life. The page is finite. Once you put the words down on paper, you fossilized your thought. Bugs in amber, nigger. But music is life itself. Music is time. Played live, played at 78 RPMS, 33 and a third, backwards, looped, whatever. There's no need for translation. You understand or you don't. Scobie gave me a shake and a hug and left the beach, leaving his cassette player on my towel. I put the headphones on and drank beer, listening to Sarah Vaughn until the battery started dying. Her voice slowed and garbled, deepened and faltered. I took a sip of beer and gurgled it in my throat. The sound was inside out, between my ears instead of outside them. Nothing was making sense. On the train home I wrote a reminder to myself to return the cassette player in the morning, then jotted down notes for a poem. Dixie slash, I wish I was in the land, oh, cotton, old time darum not forgotten, look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Is this song slash tune slash anthem inherently racist? How in the hell do I know the words to this shit? If Dixie is racist, what makes it so? The title, the lyrics, the historical context, the fact the South lost the war? If the lyrics were outlawed, banned forever, would the music, that gnawing fucking refrain, the sequence of notes themselves, be racist instrumental? Is opera classist? Does the letter R discriminate against Bostonians? Hey Mike it square next step. Chinga hia fa de Oberway. The Boston Transit Authority thanks you for your patronage. Early the next morning Coach Palomino woke me up and handed me a rubber camping flashlight. He told me that Nicholas had jumped off the roof of the law school. A custodian found him in the courtyard, he'd landed on his side, curled in a fetal position, one arm twisted behind him so violently the tips of his fingers touched the crown of his head. The rubber flashlight was in the bushes nearby. The suicide note was on the roof, taped to a case of carta blanca. To my dearest nigger Gunnar Kaufman, I've just climbed nineteen flights of stairs lugging a case of beers and whistling, Dixie. I shouldn't, but I blame you. Sitting on this ledge, my feet dangling in midair, two hundred feet off the ground, I find my thoughts going back to Tokubiai, the soy sauce dealer, and the unbelievably codependent courtesan Ohatsu in Chikamatsu's love sway fides at Sanazaki, the doomed lovers under the fronds of a palm tree binding their wrists, preparing for noble deaths. I'm on my feet now, looking down into the cloudy quadrangle, my toes hanging ten into the void. I can feel hands on my back, gently pushing. It's funny I want to write a poem. I step into the void bravely, triple A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A
I forgot to tell you the reason the bartenders wrap napkins around the beer bottles is so clumsy fools like yourself won't drop them. You know the glass gets slippery, the condensation, never mind. These brews are for you. I asked your mom to send them from home so we could celebrate the publication of your book. Cheers. Think of me. GK, tell Yoshiko and Psycho Loco I'll miss them. If there's a great beyond, I'll see you all when you get there. Holmes, there's a cloud bank floating this way. Dude, I can see the halo around my head, but I'm no angel. I'm ghost, the afterlife is just a layup away. Late, Nicholas Scobie. That night I leaned out over the ledge of the law school's roof and poured off the top of my beer. The liquid splattering on the ground made me wonder what Scobie's body had sounded like when it hit the pavement. It was a hazy night, just like the previous one. A thick cloud of fog surrounded the building. I placed the flashlight on the ventilator behind me and stood on the edge. I could see my silhouette on the surface of the cloud below. I looked like grey smoke, it was a low-budget Brock Inspector, and without the halo, the glory. I folded the note into a paper airplane and watched it spiral into the fog like a weightless kamikaze diving out of the sun. The next morning the letter was on the front page of the late edition of every paper in the country. When Yoshiko and I landed in Los Angeles the following week, an army of reporters besieged us outside the terminal. Psycho Loco sped up to the curb, stretched out over the front seat of his car, one hand on the steering wheel, the other popping open the passenger door. I didn't know Toyota made a Dunkirk rescue dinghy. Psycho Loco, like a motherfucker. Where to, my liege? Home. Can't go home. LAPD wants to speak to your ass. You like Hannibal in this hole. Beach, then, it'll be like closure. Psycho Loco and Yoshiko sat in the front seat. I sat in the back and put my hand on the dent in the upholstery where Nicholas should have been. I caught Psycho Loco's eye in the rearview mirror. Shit fucked up, right? Isn't it always? How his mother? She broke up, like everybody else. Went back to Mexico after the funeral though, something about a match against the Jalisco Jacacas. You know, in a lot of ways, Scobie was hillside. Nobody from the neighborhood ain't never come up like y'all. You two the first. I pressed Psycho Loco to stop, but he waved me off, insisting that I quit with the false modesty. I needed to hear what he had to say. We used to watch you and Sko bust niggers' asses on television every weekend. Cuz, clowns who dropped out of school in the 8th grade sporting Boston University sweatshirts and shit. Then your book came out. Oh man, we went berserk. Nobody would read it at first. Too scared. I just carried it everywhere I went, proud as hell, throwing it in people's faces. You better buy this book. Compralo, essay. My boy wrote this, so next time I see you, best to have it on you. Fools bought your shit too, because I was your number one publicist in the hood. Gave your shit street credibility. Right. Then one day we was kicking it at Rainier Park, lounging, you know how we do. I just pulled the book out and started reading it aloud. Read the shit cover to cover, twice. Who was there? Me, High Life, Pookie of course, Shamu, Lil Annie Borden, Buncha Heads, everybody crying. Niggers was happy, but upset at the same time, you know. Then the rally. Nicholas. Nobody asked why, we just understood. Peep my new tattoo. Psycho Loco held out his right arm for me to examine. On his wrist was a tattooed watch. The face of the watch was an exact likeness of a smiling Nick. In cursive letters along the edge of the thick black band was, Nick Scobie, a nigger who always knew what time it was. I lay down in the back seat and let the car's motion and the who's who of neighborhood gossip rock me to sleep. 
I dreamed I was in a squad of black kamikaze pilots. We were ambivalent about the kamikaze label because we thought, divine wind, sounded like a fart that smelled like perfume. We flew planes constructed of balsa wood and powered by rubber bands that you twisted before takeoff by turning red plastic propellers. I flew thousands of missions, all failures, because I always came back alive. I crashed into the sides of oil tankers toting 50-gallon drums of nitroglycerin and swam back to shore, unscathed save for a pair of singed eyebrows. I dive-bombed the Pentagon, a bucket of turpentine and gasoline between my legs, a grenade in each hand, a methane-farting cow strapped to my back, and firework sparklers clenched heroically in my teeth. Nothing. In shame I walked away from the flaming polygon and caught a bus back to headquarters. In disgrace I became the only kamikaze pilot ever to receive a promotion. Every night I sprinted down the tarmac toward my waiting balsa wood plane, hoping tonight would be my last mission. The numbing cold of a beer compressed against my temple woke me up. A twelve-pack of reminiscing later, night had fallen, and Psycho Loco was ready to get down to the nitty-gritty. So when you going to die? he asked. I'd heard that tone in his voice before, it was the same sarcastic timbre he had used when he goaded Buzzard into shooting a rookie Harlem Globetrotter, who in botching the confetti in the water, bucket trick had accidentally doused Buzzard with water. No one can instigate like Psycho Loco. You know, Gooner, for all that shit you talk about killing yourself, you really ain't the suicidal type. Masochistic, yes, suicidal no. So when you going to it, suicide boy? I bored the beer can into the sand and stood up ramrod straight. Sir, right now, sir, I will kill myself now, sir. Right face, huh. Calling my own cadence, I goose-stepped toward the ocean while Yoshiko beat out a drum march on her skin-tight belly and Psycho Loco whistled, the battle hymn of the Republic. They thought I was kidding, but when I was thirty yards from shore, splitting waves with my forehead, I heard Psycho Loco yelling for help. It's very hard for a strong swimmer to drown on purpose. Once my feet no longer touched the sea floor, I felt myself instinctively floating toward the surface, thinking about catching one last wave. Palms up, I flapped my arms and forced myself to submerge into the depths. The ocean was very dark. I curled into a tight tuck and let the tide bob and roll me around like an undersea tumbleweed. The muffled roar of the waves rolling overhead was comforting, and I popped my thumb in my mouth, pretending I was an embryo suspended in amniotic fluid. I began to hear Yoshiko in the shower, talking to our child as she scrubbed her stomach. Telling the child how crazy its parents were. How we were waiting for its birth so we could rent a motor home and drive to Brazil and have a baptism in the rushing waters of the Amazon. What the foo fk, I thought, it took Osamu Dazai three or four times to get this swayfied thing right. I swam back to shore, surfacing yards south of Psycho Loco and Yoshiko, knee deep in the water and screaming at the horizon. Gunnar, you come back here and be a father to your child, you son of a bitch. My mother warned me. She said, if you marry a Negro hoodlum, he'll impregnate you and leave you for a white girl. You better not be out there fucking no mermaid. Psycho Loco dropped to his knees, pounding the surf with his fists. I loved him. I loved him. I crept up behind the distraught mourners. Boo. They jumped out of their skins, happy to see me alive and pissed off that I wasn't dead. Motherfucker. I knew you couldn't do it. You didn't know shit. You thought I was in Atlantis by now. Wipe your face, you big baby. Yoshiko crossed her arms and grudgingly brushed the sand off my face. You okay? Yeah, except for the mermaid scales on my dick. Yoshiko hit me in the stomach so hard she scraped her knuckles on my spine. They made me drive home. It was two in the morning when we arrived in Hillside, and I looked for my mother on every corner examining every liquor store clique for her tight-lipped smile. Glanced at every passing car looking for a gray, haired woman hunched over the steering wheel, 
wiping the windshield with her forearm and cursing the defogger. On Robertson Boulevard, near the car wash, the outline of what looked to be an old Bonneville came sailing down the hill with its headlights off. Always the courteous driver, I flicked our lights off and on. In a panic, Psycho Loco drew his gun, opened his door, and leapt out of the car. The Bonneville turned on its headlights and sailed past with a honk of appreciation. Psycho Loco climbed back into the front seat and put a relieved hand to his still rapidly beating heart. Shit. Motherfucker, are you crazy? What? I just flashed the headlights. You the one flying through streets with the greatest of ease. Ghost Town been driving around the hood with their headlights off. So? It's an initiation. They creep around with no lights and some gangbanger apprentice in the back seat has to shoot the first fool who flashes their headlights. It was good to be home. Because of the police stakeout at my house, Yoshiko, and I checked in at the La Cienega Motor Lodge and Laundromat. Toting our luggage, we elbowed our way through the passel of giggly prom couples tossing their room keys to the night clerk as they headed for the parking lot, smoothing their dresses and spit-cleaning the stains on their tuxedos. We liked the cheap American coziness of our new home, Suite 206. I swept insect carcasses, chicken bones, and dust balls into neat piles while Yoshiko sat at the rickety kitchen table shellacking the backs of live roaches with nail polish and giving them color-coded names, a coat of sea urchin hyacinth for Walter, sugar cone brontium for Abigail, and lullaby lilac for Tatsuo. There was a scream from the room next door. Moments later a radio ad for the La Cienega Motor Lodge and Laundromat came on the combination TV slash radio, we'll leave the light on for ya, to which Yoshiko added, so the burglars think you're home. We were under constant surveillance, so we didn't go out much except to buy beer and TV dinners. During the day we'd open the creaky windows and eavesdrop on the rehab meetings in the community center next door. The crackheads and heroin addicts engaged in acrimonious debate over who constituted the lowest life form. Ah nigger, don't lie. I seen you lick a dog's dick for five dollars, then when the niggers only gave you three, you offered to fuck the telephone pole. So what I share needles with pus-covered faggots. I am a pus-covered faggot, motherfucker. Or hadn't you noticed? Yoshiko and I engaged in our own great debates. I was Dubois arguing vociferously for a continuation of our comprehensive overpriced Ivy League educations. I suggested that we attend each Ivy League school for one semester, gleaning the best bullshit from the best bullshitters, and emerge as learned scholars prepared to unravel the intricacies of the world or at least work as Wall Street market analysts. Yoshiko was Booker T. Washington fighting passionately for a more proletarian edification, one involving a practicum in the crafts and technical vocations. And what better tutelage than that offered by America's renowned correspondence colleges? Waving our grades from Boston University, 4.0s for each of us on account of Scobie's suicide, Yoshiko asked, don't you want to earn your way? Aren't you tired of having things handed to you on a silver platter? black man? You're kidding, right? Of course. Look, it'll be fun. Besides, fuck all that snow. So we enrolled at Redwood State, a college located in a post office box in the hinterlands of Chicago, Illinois. In two months' time I received a bachelor's degree in earth auguries with an emphasis in meteorology, stargazing, and horse race analysis. Yoshiko Quadruple majored in jet engine mechanics, urban forestry, auctioneering for fun and profit, and three-card Monty. Between exams we read the stacks of death poems and obituaries that arrived in the afternoon mail. Carlton Malthus Carlton Malthus, 31-year-old brewmeister at the Cascades Malts Microbrewery, located in Klamath Falls, Oregon, drank himself to death yesterday in Piss Shivers, a tavern in downtown Klamath Falls. Malthus entered the bar and ordered a Crater Lake Blue, the popular sparkling blue pilsner that he developed. He was refused service and then forcibly removed from the establishment for what one bar patron characterized as being too black to appreciate the blue. 
Returning with a keg of Crater Lake Blue, Malthus vowed to drink until his eyes turned blue or he was given a stool at the bar. Sticking the tap spout in his mouth, he drank continuously for five hours, emptying the ten-gallon keg. Removing the tap, he wrote a short poem, loudly eructated, and died. Malthus is survived by his wife Julie, son Barley, and daughter Ethanol. The poem he wrote moments before his death is below. This drunken belch leaves the last bitter taste of life in my mouth. Carol Yancey Ms. Yancey died when she impaled herself with a turkey thermometer after the checkout clerk at Buy N. Buy Supermarket refused to place the change in her hand. After a lengthy argument with store management, Ms. Yancey, ignoring the store's no-smoking policy, lit a cigarette, then stabbed herself in the frozen food section. Age 94 years Both cheeks caved in with age, I pull on a Newport menthol one last time. Falasha Noonan Ms. Noonan, distinguished pianist and leader of the world-famous free jazz big band Infernal Racket, gathered her band members for one last rehearsal. During a piano solo, she scribbled this poem on her sheet music, then leaned into the strings and smashed the piano lid on her head. Age 55 years. Having annotated the sunset I double time to heaven, talking whiskey and waltz with Monk. Merva Kilgore. Ms. Kilgore, a prolific writer from Philadelphia, published 17 volumes of poetry, including her most highly regarded work, Ancestral Hogwash, Songs and Slurs for My No AF Fount Daddy. Ms. Kilgore was giving a poetry reading at an elementary school in the Philadelphia suburbs when the school's white principal asked if she'd mind singing one of those old Negro spirituals. Hearing this, Ms. Kilgore recited the poem below, then, with her hand in the water pitcher, bit through the microphone cord, electrocuting herself. She was 69 years old. Imagine this poem is cluttered with references to obscure figures of Greek mythology, antique birchwood bureaus, and a quaint New England bed and breakfast, then send it to the New Yorker at night Yoshiko and I made soapsud sculptures in the heart-shaped jacuzzi or wrote critiques of the free porno movies. Sometimes we'd have Psycho Loco drive us to cafes in the Venice and Wilshire districts for the multicultural poetry scene. Packed with mostly white poetry devotees fawning over poets of color, the readings were ribald contests where the audience judged the poetry for political correctness, the amount of white guilt evoked, and sexual bawdiness. All the poets received belittling introductions equating them to canonical bards, next up is UFO, the unbelievable funky one, or as we like to call him, the flying Chaucer. One night a poet known as Quasimodo, the hunch in the back of your mind, read a poem entitled Uncle Sam I Am. The Dr. Susesque ballad was an account of how the poet's rough upbringing was responsible for transmogrifying him into a red, white, and blue animal that raped white women and hunted down Nigras and Mexicans. Uncle Sam I Am, do you like black niggers and white chicks named Pam? Yes, I could beat a nigger in the park and eat a pussy in the dark. Would you stab a Mexican in a tree and blame the ghetto on TV? Psycho Loco looked on in amazement and loudly remarked, I know they ain't paying this motherfucker for this phony bullshit, then unabashedly placed his silvery 9mm on the table with a heavy thunk. The poet, visibly shaken, began to rush his lines and rattle his text. Because of the Anglo-Saxon. I've no time for relaxing shooting jigaboos and honkies named Sue for satisfaction. Unable to take any more cutthroat drivel, Psycho Loco snatched his gun, walked up to the poet, and stuck the barrel into his ear canal. You so bad, read, you buster-ass mark. In a sobbing fit, the poor bard continued. Uncle Sam I am, scared of no man, white, black, clan, or tan. By the end of the poem, Quasimodo had shriveled to the floor, groveling and begging Psycho Loco not to shoot him. Freeing himself from the poet's clutches with a jackboot kick to the head, Psycho Loco leaned into the poet's bloodied face. You know what's wrong with you. Your line breaks are all fucked up. With a self-satisfied smirk, 
Psycho Loco returned to his seat and scanned the stunned crowd. Well, who's next? On with the goddamn show. Gooner, you want a beer? Yeah. And somebody get my nigger another beer. Yoshiko laughed for two days straight, but mostly she and I stayed at home listening to the real LA street soldiers receive radiotherapy. Station KQBK Sidewalk Talk Refognize Faller. This is Wilfredo from Pafoima. I want to say. I want to say. I've killed, and been killed, and teens. But leaving Ms. Vados, it's hard, essay. Camilla Parks aka K, down. I'm tired of these trifling niggers. These men's today don't resp ft they selves, mu fh less anyone else. Hey, yo Leif love the mad body slammer on the fk in. I'm falling to defend myself against the false accusations and prefabrications of the previous faller. I resp ft all women's of the world. So I hit the hoe on fay or chui fay, why, no, no big deal. What up, I'm flip out the Filipino str, 8 player baller from Artesia. I wanna say more attention needs to be paid to Asian gangsterism. The missionary s full system be fronting on a yellow brother. They ain't out to tfh nobody nothing. Thanks to our guests. Father Glenn Fernandez, Dr. Stfy Ortiz. And ex banger now community aftivist Chino Ojo Negro Aquadilla, this your host, Ras Virum Virum Kruma, signing off, and remember, all peoples of Fowler need to foam together and en espanol, Fowler no equal dolor. We chased sleep, our limbs interlocked under the lysol scented quilts, our fingertips playfully hiking up and down our bodies, trying to ignore the fold out bed's pointy prongs and rib cage, jarring metal bars by whispering potential names for the baby. Jessica, Aldo, Althea, Rosie, Hiroko, Mark, Doreen, Dallas, Octavia, Hiroshi, Joaquim, Corinthian, Marpessa, Sunday, Mamadou, Quo Vadis. On a Tuesday night late in her last trimester Yoshiko had her first craving, animal crackers, only giraffes, bears, and tigers. A blueberry slushy, and salted soybeans. Not too bad. I threw on some clothes and went out into the neon-lit night. Wary of being out alone and on foot, I decided to take the back streets to the 7-Eleven, which was a good two miles away. I darted past the ice machine and eased onto Arroyo Drive, hoping Yoshiko wouldn't mind if I substituted pumpkin seeds for the soybeans, which would be impossible to find in the middle of the ghetto at 1.30 in the morning. Ten minutes into my mission I heard the sound of helicopter blades churning the hot air. Niggers must be foofking up, I thought, remembering the fun we used to have outwitting the police copters by crawling underneath parked cars until we reached safety. I turned on to Whitworth Avenue and suddenly found myself engulfed in a blinding waterfall of blue-white light. Instinctively, my hands shot above my head as I waited for the standard drill, face down on the ground, hands behind your head, ankles crossed. Move. But no instructions were forthcoming. I waited a minute or two and looked for a police cruiser, nothing. No beat cops, only the helicopter hovering overhead and me standing in a fifty-foot circle of light, becoming more appreciative of the moon. What the fuck? I slowly eased down the street, and the tractor beam kept me at its center. If I moved two feet to the left, the spotlight moved two feet to the left, as if I were wearing a luminous Victorian whalebone dress that hula, hooped around my hips. I entered the 7-Eleven bathed in the eerie extraterrestrial light, and the clerk backed off a bit. I further terrorized him with a robotic, take me to your leader, and he shot out the back door. Gathering what I came for, I poured myself a blueberry slushy, left a $5 bill on the counter, and walked back to the motel. Yoshiko asked why her slushy was so warm and I told her about being followed by the police helicopter. She rolled her eyes. I motioned for her to follow me. Outside, we stood in the middle of Arroyo and waited in the dark. Nothing happened and Yoshiko grew impatient, sipping on her tepid slushy and whining, what? 
What? Wait a minute. You hear that? I cupped my ears and in the distance could hear the rotor blades. Then a loud click and we were standing in the world's biggest spotlight. Cool. Yoshiko smiled and handed me the lions and rhinos from the box of animal crackers. We sat at the bus stop, chewing off the ears of shortbread circus animals and enacting an urban version of waiting for Godot. You're sure you don't mind the pumpkin seeds? That depends. Do you want to grow carrots? Do we need carrots? Yes, carrots are good. Good as gold. There's nothing better than a good smoke. Phlegm. Now there was a professional. And so on until the helicopter peeled away with the dawn. Yoshiko and I took midnight strolls through hillside, our path lit by the huge flashlight in the sky. Yoshiko liked to pretend she was a newly discovered blues musician fresh from the Mississippi Delta cotton fields on her first major tour. Newport 1961. She didn't sing, she introduced herself, the band, and the song. My name is Lipless Citrus Lime, and these Hia Boys is the Dickless Wonders. We gonna play a country blues called, We gonna play a country blues. She would close her eyes and hum and moan for about a minute, then bow to the invisible crowd, basking in the spotlight, saying, Thank ye, thank ye, for another ten minutes. Once a week or so she'd march through the neighborhood carrying a sign updating the status of the baby. When am I due? Five more days. Come to the natural birthing of the child. Rainier Park, free admission if you bring a clean towel. Sometimes Psycho Loco would join us on our walks, dispensing his opinions with every swallow of his carta blanca. What kind of black man would let his wife give birth in the park? You know, I think she's doing it as a way of replacing Scobie. Giving something back to the community. At first the light, and maybe Yoshiko's odd behavior and Psycho Loco's presence, scared everyone away. We'd come strolling down the street, lit up like circus clowns under the big top, and the crowd would scatter like kitchen roaches. Eventually, emboldened by our regularity, folks joined us in the circle, and invariably they stared straight into the light source. Don't look directly into it, you'll go blind. We induced labor, making love with the purple and gold dusk beaming through the grimy motel windows. I carried Yoshiko down the stairs and propped her in a wheelchair I'd stolen from the hospital and wheeled her through the streets of Hillside. It was like a one-float parade. Yoshiko's sign read, When am I due? Now. Come to Rainier Park. Admission free if you don't say, Oh, look at all the blood, and she waved weakly at the people who lined the streets, shaking hands with those who came to the wheelchair to bestow flowers. The searchlight seemed especially bright that warm Friday night. When we arrived at the park, the neighborhood welcomed Yoshiko with a huge ovation. The stoical gun Totten hooligans provided security, Manny and Sally Montoya supplied clean towels and rubber gloves from the barbershop, and Ms. Kim brought refreshments from her new store. My mom was the midwife, and her obstetric skills were in evidence as she led Yoshiko to a small section of grass turned into a birthing theme park. There my mother had constructed an outdoor maternity ward out of tarpaulins, beanbags, and throw pillows. Next to this was a small bathing pool and a table lined with shiny medical supplies, sutures, scissors, a clamp, and a cellular phone in case of emergency. Yoshiko undressed and slipped into the pool, flopping around with each twinge of labor pain as my mom checked her blood pressure and timed the contractions. The locals filed by, shouting encouragement and wishing Yoshiko luck. After a few hours it was time, Yoshiko clambered onto the cushy mountain and squatted on the ridge of beanbags. My job was to massage her feet, feed her salted soybeans, and wipe her down with cold sponges. When my mother commanded her to push, Yoshiko looked me in the eye and squeezed my biceps to mush. I returned her gaze, trying to think of something reassuring to say, but all that came out was, beautiful, beautiful. Yoshiko stopped grimacing, and my mother placed a slimy guck-covered infant on her chest. 
It laid its teeny head on her breast, the mother smiled, and the baby made a gargoyle face that I called a smile. Naomi Katsu Kaufman was welcomed into the world with kisses. There was cheering, the blasts of car horns, and bottle rockets bursting in the night sky. A box of cigars attached to a small parachute landed next to the newborn. The card read, Congratulations from the Los Angeles Police Department. Maybe this one will grow up with a respect for authority. I couldn't be sure, but it looked like my father's hand. I lit a stogie and put an arm around my wife and child. You. She looks like the creature from the Black Lagoon. Gooner. I'm just saying. My mom put a cereal bowl in my hands and shoved me into the hallowed junction of Yoshiko's spread legs. Squat. I did as ordered, hunkered in front of my wife's swollen vulva and gently kissed her bloody perineum, and awaited the afterbirth. Ma, this is fucked up. You know, this is my favorite cereal bowl. Yoshiko reached between her legs and condescendingly patted my forehead. The placenta dropped into the bowl, a quivering bloody mass of now useless organ. Someone in the crowd asked when we were going to do this again. I answered, next week, and lifted the pulpy organ in the direction of the officers in the helicopter. Thus behold the only thing mightier than yourself. Yoshiko laughed and said, Roots, right? Come over here and cut the cord, then give me a beer and a kiss. Every Friday night we held outdoor open mics, called the Black Bacchanalian Misery Fests, under the LAPD's simple but effective stage lighting. We jerry-rigged a sound system using car stereos loud enough to drown out the noise from the helicopter. I was the MC, Yoshiko the stage manager, and Psycho Loco did everything else. The shows lasted all night, and the neighborhood players read poetry, held car shows, sang, danced, ad-libbed harangues about everything from why there are no Latino baseball umpires to the practicality of sustaining human life on Mars. Sometimes troops of children simply counted to a hundred for hours at a time. Every week there was at least one hour of community stigmas. Community stigmas was a loosely run part of the misery fest where the neighborhood stigmatized groups got a chance to quit FH and defend their actions to the rest of the neighborhood. I'd call the registered voters to the stage to explain why they bothered, request that all the welfare cheats step forward and share their fraudulent scams, ask the panhandlers to say what they really thought of their spare change benefactors, offer $50 to any Muslim who'd eat a fatty slab of bacon. The most poignant nights were the ones when the recovered addict stepped into the light to soak up the warm applause and address the crowd. I want to thank all my cool-outs who stood by me, but mostly I want to thank self for not giving up on self. Then I'd ask all the current users to step up into the ring of light and speak out. The bold users would swagger into the circle, smoking their pipes, needles dangling from their arms, playing up to the booze like villainous wrestlers. The invitations weren't always voluntarily accepted, and a few reluctant baseheads would be forced into the spotlight by disgruntled friends and family. No one could leave until he'd said something, anything from, I promise on my grandmama's grave to stop, to, I don't give a fuck. I'll smoke till white people have feelings. The drug dealers also got their say. Every third Friday we'd have Psycho's analysis, where Psycho Loco conducted these heart-wrenching gangbanger tribunals. Some hoodlums would volunteer to bear their souls. They'd sit on wooden stools, speaking thoughtfully into microphones, unburdening themselves like war criminals, black gunny sacks stretched over the heads of the wanted ones to prevent the police from using an overhead skycam to identify them. Soon the Bacchanalian misery fests became gala events, Colored folks from all over Los Angeles crashed hillside to take part in the spectacle. To ensure that the Friday nights didn't turn into a trendy happening for witties bold enough to spelunk into the depths of the ghetto, Psycho Loco stationed armed guards at the gate to keep out the blue-eyed solsters. Questioning anyone who looked to be of Caucasian descent, the sentries showed those of dubious ancestry a photograph of a radial, tire-colored black man, then asked, What's darker than this man's face? 
Anyone who didn't answer, his butt, or, his nipples, didn't get in. The networks caught wind of the Misery Fest's popularity and offered a bundle of money for the rights to broadcast weekly installments. We accepted the best offer and divvied it up among all the households in Hillside, and the television station agreed to the following conditions. Build the Rainier Park Amphitheater and pay for its maintenance. Build huge video screens throughout the neighborhood. Use only colored camera persons and support staff. All broadcasts must be live and unedited. Stay the fuck out of the way. The next scheduled broadcast was on the two-year anniversary of Scobie's death. There were widespread rumors that I would use the national forum to immolate myself Buddhist monk style and skewer my daughter Naomi on a barbecue spit rotating over my pyre. Niggers jammed the theater and filled the streets of Hillside to pay their last respects. Television expected the rest of the bloodthirsty world to tune in for the first live broadcast of a suicide. The fest opened with an hour of silence followed by a parade of local residents declaring their undying love for Nicholas, most of the tearful reminiscences starting with, I remember when that nigger wasn't but about ya big. But it was my show, I was his best friend, obliged to use the Bell's Lettre to fortify Scobie's status as a sainted martyr. I opened with a powerful two-hour rago ode to Nicholas entitled Barrio Bangladesh, throughout which the audience rocked in their seats, wailing with my rhythmic recitation. When I finished, I looked into twenty thousand faces in stone silence. The audience was anesthetized, unable to move. A review of the night's festivities stated that the poem brought every listener in the house to the zenith of comprehension. Not since the New Testament has the death of morality been so eloquently eulogized. I announced my next poem, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Crib Death. After I read the last few stanzas remorse lies not in the consciousness of a murderous parent who rocks a child born into slavery to divine sleep with jugular lullaby sung by sharp blade and suffocating love applied with pillow and pressure remorse lies in the slave owner's anguished cries upon discovering his property permanently damaged. A bloody hieroglyph carved into flesh the smiling lips swollen and blue with asphyxiation after he calculates his losses forecasts the impact on this year's crop he will notice the textual eyes of murder slash suicide read, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware hillside erupted. Niggers lost their fucking minds. When the huzzas reached their climax, I prepared for my encore, a small sacrifice and show of appreciation to Nick Scobie, to any niggers who cared. I launched into a solemn monologue explaining how through painstaking research I'd unearthed proof that President Truman's threat to drop a third atomic bomb on Japan was not, as he later claimed, merely an idle boast to intimidate the land of the rising sun into a speedy surrender. Elongated cries of disbelief rang out from the bleachers, no. Yes, I replied holding up photos of grinning Manhattan Project scientists casually leaning and squatting around three bombs, fat man, little boy, and the newly discovered svelte guy, each with cute slogans like, flatten Japan, and, sorry for stepping on your toe, Joe, chalked on the metallic hull. You may pass these photographs around. I have the negatives. As the photos circulated through the audience, I produced a white handkerchief and a shiny carving knife from my back pocket and placed them on the rostrum. Carefully smoothing the hanky out toward the corners, I issued a challenge to the United States government. When I was a child, my dad before he left us, the fuck whenever I did something wrong, he used to say, I brought you into this world and I'll take you out. Well, Big Daddy, Uncle Sam, oh great white father, you brought me here so I'm asking you to take me out. Finish the job. Pass the ultimate death penalty. Authorize the carrying out of Directive 1609, kill all niggers. Don't let svelte guy lie dormant in the basement of the Smithsonian. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb on me. Drop the bomb on hillside. I placed the pinky of my right hand on the handkerchief. With my left hand I picked up the knife and sterilized it with a couple of passes over my pants leg. Before someone could ask, what the hell are you doing? I brought the knife down over my finger and hacked it off with one strike. 
I'd prepared myself for the pain, but I wasn't ready for the amplified sound that pounded out of the monitors. 100,000 crunching watts of stainless steel cleaving through bone followed by the solid kafunk of the knife into the mahogany lectern, followed by my gasp, the audience's gasp, and my deep inhalation in shock. The first thing I heard was the familiar voice of Coach Shimamoto yelling from the front row, Suck it up, Kaufman. I reeled for a moment, then meticulously wrapped the speckled red and white handkerchief around the severed finger, exactly as I'd seen Robert Mitchum do in some American Yakuza movie. Staring at the space where my finger used to be, I held my hand high above my head. The blood ran down my arm, and what didn't pool in my armpit puddled next to my sneakers. I lowered my head, then exited stage left, the soles of my blood-soaked shoes sticking to the floorboards as if I were walking in yesterday's spilled soda. That night cemented my status as savior of the blacks. The distraught minions interpreted my masochistic act as sincerity, the media as lunacy. The more I tried to deny my ascendancy, the more beloved I became. Spiteful black folk and like-minded others from across the nation continued to immigrate to Hillside, seeking mass martyrdom. They refurbished the abandoned houses and erect tent cities on the vacant lots, transforming the neighborhood into a hospice. The government's reluctant confirmation of the existence of Svelte Guy spurred a massive letter-writing campaign asking the government not to waste the uranium and to test the antiquated A-bomb by dropping it on those ungrateful passive-aggressive LA niggers. Ignoring the Japanese claim of dibs to the bomb as a keepsake of war, Congress passed a motion to quell our insurrection by issuing an ultimatum, rejoin the rest of America or celebrate Kwanzaa in hell. The response was to paint white concentric circles on the roofs of the neighborhood, so that from the air hillside looks like one big target, with La Cienega Motor Lodge and Laundromat as the 50-point bullseye. Epilogue It's been a lovely 500 years, but it's time to go. We're abandoning this sinking ship America, lightening its load by tossing our histories overboard, jettisoning the present, and drydocking our future. Black America has relinquished its needs in a world where expectations are illusion, has refused to develop ideals and mores in a society that applies principles without principle. Past movements in the black struggle seem to have had the staying power of an asthmatic marathoner with no sense of direction, so I suppose as movements go, this one is better than most. No more pleading for our promised 40 acres and a mule only to have some hasty Dixiecrat respond, these people wouldn't know a switchback from a switchblade. No futile attempts at organization. No, help fold, staple, and label, parties. No one asks for donations. You never hear words and phrases such as, grassroots, mobilize, subcommittee, who has the phone tree, and Cointelpro bandied about with counterinsurgent smugness. Best of all, in my humble opinion, I'm not the type of leader to promote self-help and self-love with put-downs and vituperation. You'll never hear me say, Scientology is a gutter religion. I didn't satiate our sweet-tooth cravings for respect and vengeance like a Sunday school teacher rewarding good behavior with Uncle Tom white chocolate, sneaky Hebrew butterscotch, and empowerment peppermints. Who fan take a rainbow, drop it in a sigh, soak it in the sun and make a groovy lemon pie. The Fandy Man, the Fandy Man Fan. Mostly I stay at home, Suite 206, the La Cienega Motor Lodge and Laundromat, bathing Naomi while Yoshiko and my mother watch Zatoichi movies, the blind swordsman plowing through his unlucky foes like a wheat thresher. Sometimes Psycho Loco comes to visit, wearing his silver radiation suit, just in case the feds decide to annihilate us ahead of schedule. I dip Naomi in the jacuzzi and rub baby oil into the creases in her arms, and my best friend and I talk, death row prisoner to visitor. You know, Gooner, with all this suicidal madness, you taking the easy way out. Why don't you fight back? Go out like a hero. Dirt on your face, guns blazing. Psycho loco, everyone who's ever challenged you, what have you done to them? I waxed that ass. So it's useless for an enemy to challenge you, right? See, Claro. 
might as well kill myself, right? Why give you the satisfaction? The trippy part is that when you really think about it, me and America aren't even enemies. I'm the horse pulling the stagecoach, the donkey in the levee who stumbled in the mud and come up lame. You may love me, but I'm tired of thrashing around in the muck and not getting anywhere, so put a nigger out his misery. I pile the suds high on Naomi's head like a wobbly Ku Klux Klan hood and tell her the Kaufman history. I begin with the end, Rolf Kaufman, her grandfather, my dad, who died last week. The only officer in the history of the Los Angeles Police Department to commit suicide by eating his gun, choking on the firing pin and leaving the following poem in his locker. Like the good Reverend King I too, have a dream, but when I wake up I forget it and remember I'm running late for work. The end of the book. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with a new book.